Hello, everyone. Today, we have a fabulous webinar. Sunray, in conjunction with Cotney Law Firm, has another fabulous webinar that is conducted by Danielle Maya. She has over 20 years of experience as an attorney. Her practice encompasses all areas of construction law. So today we're going to learn about the tricks you can't miss on securing your payments, which is a part two of our three-part webinar. My name is Ariella Wagner, and I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions, a national preliminary notice service that helps thousands of subcontractors and suppliers secure their lien and bond claim rights. So without further ado, I introduce the fabulous Danielle. Thank you so much, Ariella. I really appreciate this opportunity. So um, I'm going to ask the question again, asked this last time we presented, but anybody out there like to work for free? Uh, I'm not hearing any responses. So today I'm going to share some more secrets with you on increasing your chances to make money on your Texas projects. Unfortunately, if you're doing work in Texas, uh, if you don't uh, follow to a T these notice procedures, your lien procedures, don't ask for the information up front, you might not get paid on a project. And owners know this, and so you've got to you got to be real careful. Um, it's been said that Texas is one of the most complicated and confusing states for perfecting and filing mechanics liens, but mechanics liens are still the best option for securing your payment. For example, in Colorado, um, all you need to do is send a notice of lien 10 days prior to filing the lien, and then file your lien within four months of the last day you were on site. So that's pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, another example of an easy state is Florida. Uh, you have to give a notice within 45 days of starting the work on the site, whether they're paying or not, and then make sure that you file your lien within 90 days from the last time you worked. So today, we're gonna untangle the Texas lien and bond claim process uh, still focusing on liens today, we're going to cover bonds in our next uh, next seminar. Uh, today our focus is on original contractors, the manufacturers of specially manufactured materials, and retainage. So after listening to this, you're going to be able to tell what tier you fall in, why it's important to know your tier, uh, whether you're working on a bonded project, what types of notices to send, and what time frame to send them in. So one of the most important things to do is right when you start the project, send out a request for information. And over here on the left side of the screen, I've got how your request should start out. You can copy that exact language. And then there's eight different things that you need to ask for, and we'll, we'll walk through it. But here's why it's important. Because Texas doesn't require when you start work on the project that you notify the owner, hey, I'm working on your project and I've got a $100,000 project um, contract on this project that I'm gonna need to get paid on eventually. Um, so the owner might not know that you're there, especially if you're doing specially manufactured materials or you're a subcontractor. If you've contracted with the owner, um, they probably know you're there. But even in some states where you've contracted with the owner, you still have to let them know that you, you've started work on the project. So Texas isn't one of those states. Texas isn't one of those states where the owner has to file a no notice of starting the project. Sometimes those are called notices of commencement. Um, so there's nothing that the owner has to do to let you know what was, what's going on on the project. So you have to, the burden's on you to ask for this information from the owner. And so this is, this is best practices, and this is what you should do on every single project. So the first thing that you're gonna ask for is a legal description of the property where you're doing the project. You're also gonna ask for the name and address of a surety company if there's a bond on the project, uh, whether the name and address of the person having the lien or bond on the project, the date on which the original contract for the project were executed. Now this is really important because um, you know if you're a manufacturer of specially manufactured uh, materials, you're not gonna know that. And this is important stuff for you to know. Um, if you have to later come and do your notices and file your liens, um, you also want the name and address of the property owner. If you didn't contract with them, you want the name and address for all original contractors. So anyone who has a, a direct contract with the owner, you're wanting all of their contact information 
and then you're going to request the dates of termination or abandonment of all original contracts because that's going to be key for filing your retainage, uh, your retainage notices and re your retainage lien. And then also ask for the affidavit of completion. And then you want to also include this other line at the bottom there. And this puts the burden back on the owner. If any of this information changes during the course of the project, that you're requesting that the owner supplement the response within 10 days. If you do this, then the owner can't shortcut things at the end of the project or um, you know, keep you out in the cold if they terminate the original contractor that you were working for. So what tier do you fall under? We've kind of touched on this, but if you have a contract signed by the person that's owning that property, you're an original contractor. If you don't and you're signing a contract with someone who signed a contract with the owner, then you're a first tier subcontractor. If you're further down the line, you're a second tier subcontractor. And then here's kind of the special guy, the manufacturer of specially manufactured materials. If you're making a product that can't be used on any other project, for example, um, oftentimes windows fall into this or doors, um, sometimes turrets on buildings, special ornamental things for buildings that can't be used on any other project, then you fall into a complete other category. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So here's why it's important to know your tier. Um, if you're a subcontractor, then you have to send a notice, and we talked about this in the other presentation, but just have to reiterate it. You have to send a notice for every month you're not getting paid fully on the job. So most states, you just have to wait till the end of the project, and you know from your last day, you can say, yeah, I've been working on this project for a year, and even in month one, I wasn't getting paid. File your lien on it, and you're fine. But in Texas, that doesn't work. So every single month that you're not getting paid, um, that's that's another trigger to send out another notice letter. Um, the, the trick here, if you're second tier, we touched on this uh, last time, but you have to send out two monthly notices and you have to send them out very early. And we'll look at that in a second. And we already talked about the specially manufactured materials, something that can't be used in any other project. So overall, there's about six different types of notices that could be required plus the filing of two different mechanics lien, mechanics lien for the amount that you're owed, and then also for the retainage, if any retainage was being withheld on your project. So these are the different types of notices. Notice of retainage or contract termination. Notice of specially manufactured materials. The second month's notice of non-payment, the third month's notice of non-payment, and the second and third month's notice of non-payment, those could apply to um, you if you've got specially manufactured materials, so you might have to jump into those boats too, um, depending on who you contracted with. If you contracted with the owner, then you don't have to worry about the second and third month notices. And then your notice of non-payment lien affidavit, that's what's filed after you file your lien affidavit, and the notice of filing your retainage lien affidavit also filed after you file that retainage lien. So what are you going to send, and when are you going to send it? On private commercial projects, for everyone but the original contractor, you've got to send the non-payment notices and liens. And the key here is the deadline to start sending those is measured from the month following each month in which all or part of the, labors, the labor or materials was performed or delivered. So the purpose of this is to trap the funds in the hand of the owner. You want to trap them before the owner pays them out to the original contractor. So if you send this notice um, timely and properly to the owner, then the owner can withhold payments to the original contractor for the amount in your notice so that he can pay your claim and he can do it immediately. The owner has to hold the funds until the time for you to file your affidavit of mechanics lien has passed or if your lien was filed, then until your lien has been satisfied or released. So this really traps up the money so that it doesn't run away from you. So if you're an original contractor, um, 
that is can be a really good thing um, for commercial projects. It's not so great on residential projects because there's a lot of different um, extra stuff that you've got to do on residential projects. But on commercial projects, your life is going to be pretty easy because you've contracted directly with the owner. You only have to do um, one filing, and that's your lien affidavit. Um, so there's no notices to send out because the owner already knows about you, knows what the contract price is. Um, so you've just got to watch the lien trigger date, and that's the last month in which the original contract was completed, finally settled, terminated, or abandoned. And you've got to make sure that you get your lien on file by the 15th day of the fourth month. And then send a notice after you filed that, and you can send it contemporaneously with the filing, and that's what we generally do. So basically, you're sending that out to the owner saying, hey, here's the lien affidavit, and here's the notice that I'm sending it to you um, so that you know that I've got a lien on file. So here's where it gets a little trickier, is if, um, if you've specially manufactured materials for this project, and they can't be used in any other project, then you've got a lot more things that you've got to do. So your trigger date, and this is a really early date, it's the last day of the month in which you receive or accept the order from the materials. So that's when your timeline starts running. And you've got to send uh, the non-payment notice trigger the last day of each month. The materials were sent to the site and not paid in full. Here's when you send your notice that I'm making materials that can't be used in any other site. It's the 15th day of the second month to the owner and the original contractor from the day, and this is the thing that differs from the second tier subcontractors, the date that you received and accepted the order. So you want to let them know um, in plenty of time to cancel that order that uh, you are making materials that can't be used any, any other time. And so this number four only pops up if you're really a second tier subcontractor. So if, if you have a contract with the owner, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the third month non-payment notice, again, if you don't have a contract with the owner and you've contracted with an original contractor, that's when you need to be aware of that. And then the lien trigger date is the same that it is for everyone else, the last day of the month um, that material was furnished to the site. And then for the filing of the lien affidavit, I don't know if we can get that better for you on the screen there, but um, it's also the 15th day of the fourth month. And then you also have to send the notices of non-payment for the lien affidavit five days after, um, within five days of filing that lien affidavit. So we like to send those contemporaneously. And here's what you want to put in that notice. Um, when you're sending that notice out, telling the owner, hey, I'm making materials, telling the owner and, and original contractor, I like to just tell everybody upstream um, what's what's going on. So this is what you need to put in your, your notice that I'm making materials that can't be used in any other project. Um, one, of course, that these are specially manufactured for this project and cannot be used in any other project, and that the order has been received and accepted in the price of the order. So next we're going to talk about retainage, and this is where if you haven't sent that request for information that we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, then the owner can uh, shorten his deadlines and, and kind of uh, make it so that you have to act pretty quickly or watch the real property filings to see when you need to get your your lean in for retainage. I like to tell clients, don't wait. Um, if you have retainage amount, you're done on the project, go ahead and send your notice on that. Um, if you haven't been paid on your retainage, go ahead and, and file your retainage lien um, on that. Um, file it right away. Do not delay because you don't want to get left out in the cold. Um, and especially if you haven't sent that request for information, because if you didn't send that request for information, then the ball's in your court to monitor. Basically, you've got to just sit there and daily look at the real property records and see if the owner's filed anything, because he's not going to have any burden, any requirement to send you anything unless you sent that request for information letter. So let's walk through the dates a little bit. The retainage trigger date is the earliest of the last day of the month that you are done 
or the original contractor is done. So if the original contractor gets fired on the project, he's done. Um, and so that's that can that can creep up on you. So you don't don't want to let, be left out in the cold. If you sent that request for information, then the burden's on the owner to notify you of all this stuff happening. So you send your retainage notice the earliest of the 30th day after you are done on the project or the original contractor is done, um, and you send this to the owner and the original contractor. I like to send it right at the beginning of the project. If, if, if they're pulling the, the statutory 10% out of your project, um, let them, out of your, the payment um, that you're getting, and let the owner know that right away. You don't have to wait to send that retainage notice. notice. Um, you don't have to wait till you're done. Um, send it when you start the project. But here's the, the drop dead deadlines for filing the retainage lien affidavit. It's gonna be the earliest of the 15th day of the fourth month, the last day after which you worked on the site or you provided materials, or the 40th day after the owner files an affidavit of completion, 40 days after the notice that the original contractor is done, so that means 40 days after you get some notice, or not whether you get it or not, whether it's filed in the real property records that the original con contractor has been terminated or abandoned the job, or 30 days from the owner's notice of demand for filing lien affidavits. And then again, um, like all the other lien affidavits that you're filing, you've got to also file a notice, not file a notice, you've got to send a notice of that to the owner and original contractor within five days of filing that lien affidavit. So here's something interesting, um, where Texas is a little different from some other states. The punch work actually extends the completion date and the deadline for filing liens, but warranty work does not. Most other states, the punch work does not even extend it. So it's just straight up work done under the contract or executed change orders. But Texas is a little different that way. Here's an example of what you need to put in your notice of retainage. Uh, the rule in Texas, I touched on that a little bit earlier, but they're required to hold withhold 10% of the contract price on all original contracts and retain those funds for 30 days until after the work is complete. So here's what you put in it. Um, you have that nice title there, include the Texas property code, just copy this um, verbatim, put in your own information date, um, and you know to whom it may concern, uh, claim it, that's you, hereby has a contract with your original contractor, your subcontractor, whomever it is, and that subcontractor or that original contractor is holding withholding 10%, 8%, 20% of retainage for work done by you. And that's pretty much all you need to have in it, and that would that would take care of it for you. Pretty simple. So this is really only going to apply for uh, the specially manufactured material uh, notice. But this is the notice that you need to, word for word, just copy and put this right in your uh, notice letter if you're doing specially manufactured materials. Uh, original contractors don't have to do this. So now we're moving on to residential projects. And this is where it gets a little difficult for original contractors. Um, there's only one tier of subcontractors and it's everybody moves to the second tier level. So uh, if you've done specially manufactured materials and you didn't have a contract signed by the owners of the property, then you need to watch out for those deadlines. The notice of non-payment is the 15th day of the second month, just like it would be for a second tier subcontractor. And everyone must file a non-payment lien affidavit by the 15th day of the third month. So sometimes it's hard to determine if you're actually on a residential project. If you're multifamily, you're probably not. Um, so the statute defines it as a single family house, duplex, triplex, or quadruplex. So four units, um, after four units, then um, it would not be considered a residence. And it has to be owned by one or more adult persons and used or intended to be used as a dwelling. So here are the additional requirements. 
if it's a homestead, and this is these are more kind of contractual requirements, but if you don't have these things in your contract and then you go to try to file a lien, your lien will not be valid and you could um, you could have somebody uh, file an action saying that you had a fraudulent lien because you didn't have the right statutory warnings in your contract or you didn't you didn't follow all these contractual initial steps and so these are super important on the front end to make sure that your lien is valid on the back end so the original contractor has to get a contract signed before any work is done it has to be signed by both spouses or all owners because texas is a community property state that's why we require both spouses to sign here's the real kicker this is a big huge deal you have to file that contract in the real property records. Um, it's best practice to file it before you actually start work or file it during the time that you're working on the project. However, you can still file it. Um, you can still file it in the real property records when you're getting ready to file your lien, but here's the kicker. This is the real problem. <laughs> Nobody hardly ever does this, but you need to have the signature by the homeowners on that contract notarized and here's why because when you file that contract in the real property records real property records do not accept filings unless they're notarized you cannot file a document in the real property records without having it notarized so we can try to do some tricky lawyer lawyering stuff on the back end to try to attach an affidavit to it um, to get it notarized but it's not really best practices and I think if it got challenged in a court it probably would not be with up, upheld so the special language um, you need to include special language in your notice of non-payment before filing your lien so here's some other things that you need to do before you can have a valid lien you have to file prepare a disclosure statement you have to give a list of subcontractors and suppliers you have to provide a bills paid affidavit final bills paid affidavit and a disbursement statement so we're going to walk through these one by one what's required on them the notice prior to contract also known as the disclosure statement texas requires that you give this exact statement to every single homeowner that you contract with it is very lengthy it's about uh a page single space it's in the Texas property code section 53.255 you can google that up or you can email me I'm happy to give it to you it was too much uh, to put on the slide in this presentation and it's uh, it's pretty boring stuff to read through but you need to have that in your contract otherwise your lien won't be valid so the list of subcontractors and suppliers It's this exact language that you need to put in your contract. You can copy and paste. I, it, was, it was pretty short, so I, I put it right there on the slide for you. Um, but the cool thing is you don't have to constantly update them if you have a waiver. And I'm gonna show you what the waiver looks like. If you get the homeowner to sign off on the waiver, then you don't have to constantly update that homeowner when you change suppliers or subcontractors. Here's what the waiver looks like. Copy that, paste that right into your contract, get both spouses to sign off on that, both property owners, if there's six property owners, get them all to sign off on it. Um, and then you don't have to constantly update them about your suppliers and subcontractors when those change. So here's the third thing that you're gonna have to do before you have a valid affidavit, um, a lien affidavit. You need to send them a final bills paid affidavit before taking the final payment. This is something that everybody who contracts with an owner on a residential property has to do. Um, it states that it has paid every person below you for the work they've done on the property. And the fourth uh, kind of additional requirement that you've got to do is you've got to send a disbursement statement. So this is providing a name and address of each person who subcontracted directly with the original contractor who you intend to pay.
So this is something that you need to include. This is another notice requirement that you need to include in your contract with your homeowner. So copy this language directly. This is about the retainage and their burden to uh, withhold retainage on the project. Um, they need to know about that in writing and the burdens on them to withhold that retainage. So how do you go about doing it? Well, it's important that all of your notices need to be sent certified mail. I said registered or certified mail. Hardly anyone uses registered mail anymore, but certified mail return receipt requested is uh, the preferred method. Um, that's the method that the statute uh, requires, and that's why we do it. You, you might think, oh, well, we'll send it FedEx, um, then I can track it. But the statute um, doesn't uh, really recognize that. And so if they didn't get it or they say they didn't get it and you sent it FedEx, um, you might be out of luck on that. But if you sent it certified mail, uh, then it's deemed that they got it. Here's what you need to put in your lien affidavits. It has to be a sworn statement of the amount of the claim, a general statement describing the kind of work done and the materials furnished, a legally sufficient description of the property. So uh, we like to put the physical property address and ours also have um, the precise uh, legal description of the property as it's been recorded in the real property records. And all subcontractors who have sent notices, if you didn't have a contract directly with the owner and you sent those preliminary notices, you've got to send details of all those notices and the dates of sending them in your lien affidavit. So the good news is on commercial projects, if, um, if you file the lien affidavit, the court has to give you your attorney's fees for trying to uh, move forward on your lien affidavit for um, all the work that your attorney did on that. But on residential, they may award attorney's fees. So it's kind of up to the court on that. So it's not a it's not a home run. There's a lot of states that even on commercial projects that the court isn't mandated to award attorney's fees. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the deadline to foreclose on your mechanics lien on a commercial project, it's generally two years from when you were supposed to file your lien. And on a residential project, it's generally one year. There's some exceptions for that. So we could talk to you more about that, um, but those are kind of a case-by-case -case deal. So something to keep in mind, when you, when you send your notices, you want to be really broad on your notice, and you can be broad on the amount owed, on the dates that you were out there. Uh, the notice is not a legal document. The lien affidavits, you have to be super conservative on, and you, you almost want to understate it than overstate it. Um, if you didn't actually do the work, on the project, um, if if they terminated you halfway through, um, you had a million dollar contract on the project, and and they terminated after you did five hundred thousand dollars worth of work. Do not file a lien affidavit for a million dollars. Don't file it for five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You have to file it just for five hundred thousand dollars, and you have to be right on on the date. And don't fudge anything up because otherwise, you might be hit with a. a a claim for a fraudulent lien. Um, this can carry uh, criminal penalties uh, and you can uh, get fined up to $10,000 or actual damages plus exemplary damages, attorney's fees. Um, it's just not some place you want to go. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ariella. Thank you so much, Danielle. So yes, so I, I apologize for that. Yes, we're going to talk about some of these are uh, the software that we have for subcontractors and suppliers, as well as general contractors, uh, to utilize the Sunray system. Um, so as you could see, you easily send your notices online in the Sunray system. So with what Daniela was talking about, worrying about sending notices by certified mail or registered mail, you don't have to worry about that because Sunray takes care of that for you. Um, if you go ahead to the next slide for me. In less than 60 seconds, if you have the information available, which would be where you are working, the job site address, who you have a contract with, 
hypothetically, if as Danielle was saying, and it's extremely important to know this, if you are a sub of a sub to a general contractor, you clearly want to know who the general contractor is. That would be the person that was hired by the owner of the property. So if you have that information available within 60 seconds, you could enter that into the Sunray system. So go ahead and let's go on to the next screen. What's also fabulous about the Sunray system is that the deadlines are really difficult to manage. And through the Sunray system, you get set up your email reminders so that you do not lose any of your lien and or bond claim rights. You go to the next slide for me. In addition, you can use the Sunray system to do all of your waivers and releases absolutely free. All you have to do is log in. It's a form. You have your partials, your conditionals, your language so that you're not waiving uh, your lien rights. And you could do that all for free online. You could store your waiver and releases once they've been notarized online. And it's a fabulous tool for you instead of having to use a Word document. Would you be so kind of go to the next slide? Thank you. And at this point, if you have any questions for Danielle, please feel free to enter your questions. Um, please do not give out any um, company names for purposes of, uh, for legal purposes. But if you have any questions, go ahead and, and put them into the box on the right hand side. And so far, Danielle, you've done such a sensational job. I don't see that we have any questions, but if we go to our next slide. We have another part three of our, our three part series, our final um, webinar that you should absolutely consider signing up for on February 12th. Um, and if anyone has any uh, questions on the next slide, we have Danielle's contact information, and my information. So please feel free to reach out to Danielle or if you feel, feel free uh, to reach out to me via phone or email and we would be happy to answer any of your questions. Danielle, you did an incredible job. Thank you so much. And um, I hope everyone has a sunny day. Danielle, feel free to express Thank anything you. you need to say. Thank you, Ariella. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Bye bye for now.